Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. A symbol of the Nazis. It could be seen at the top of the state Christmas tree in the 1930s and 40s. Almost the entire German nation supported and looked evil in the face and they saluted Heil Hitler. Incredible darkness fell upon Germany. There was a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was born in Germany in February of 1906. He was a German Lutheran pastor, a theologian. He was the first pastor theologian to make a public stand against the Nazi empire. And he was a founding member of the Confessing Church. Apart from his theological writings, Bonifer became known for his great courage, his staunch resistance to the Nazi dictatorship. He strongly opposed Hitler's genocidal persecution of the Jews. He was actually six of eight children of a prominent family. His father, Karl Bonifer, was a distinguished neurologist. Expected to follow his father into medicine, Bonifer surprised his parents and he decided as a teenager to become a theologian and pastor. His older brother told him not to waste his life, the institution of the church, but his brother was killed in World War I and that actually made an impact on him to go into the ministry. He said, if what you say is true, I shall reform it. Bonifer graduated summa cum laude from the University of Berlin in 1927. He earned a doctorate in theology at the age of only 21. He wrote a thesis on the communion of saints, which presented a way of looking at the nature of the Christian church in a different way. He was praised by the great theologian of the time, Karl Barth, and Carl called it a theological miracle. He talked about the community of Christians working together to establish God's kingdom on earth. He wrote and preached that Christians should be involved in politics. In 1930, Hitler's rise in the public eye was growing. Still too young to be ordained, Bonifer went to the United States in that year. The Roaring Twenties were now over, but America was entering a major depression. In America, he met an African-American, Frank Fisher. Frank introduced him to the Baptist Church in Harlem. It was not like anything Bonifer had ever experienced or seen. The emotion, the singing was very different. Bonifer taught Sunday school and he formed a lifelong love for the African-American spirituals, a collection of which he took back to Germany in the summer of 1931, when Germany was experiencing a catastrophe. The world was in chaos. He saw that the majority of the German people, a democracy, was publicly denying their faith and they were following the ideas of Hitler himself. The church was also guilty of preparing the foundation for Hitler. Hitler preached about going forward and making the German people strong. Hitler made an idol of himself and he had growing support of the church too. At this time, Bonifer did a radio program against Hitler, but the Nazis cut it off the air. 
Bonifer was a dedicated man of the Christian faith. He was resolved to carry out the teachings of Christ as revealed in the scriptures. He preached, when you read the Bible, you must think that here and now God is speaking with me. He taught that salvation came only from Christ and nowhere else. He was a determined opponent of the Nazi regime from its very first days. Two days after Hitler was installed as chancellor, as I said, Bonifer delivered a radio address in which he attacked Hitler and he warned Germany against slipping into the idolatrous cult of the Fuhrer, the leader, who could very well turn out to be a misleader or a seducer. That, my friends, was very prophetic. Bonifer was right. Hitler seduced the nation. And now the Nazis started their persecution of the Jewish people. The Jewish boycott that began as the minister of propaganda shut down their stores. The German Nazi soldiers chanted, Germans, liberate yourselves from the rule of the Jews. And unfortunately at this time, the pulpits were silent. They didn't do much to stop this terrible persecution of the Jews. In April of that year, Bonifer raised the first voice for church resistance to Hitler's persecution of the Jews. He declared that the church must not simply bandage the victims under the wheel, but jam the spoke in the wheel itself. Hitler now unconstitutionally imposed new laws that made it impossible for Jews to hold any office or have any private business or home or property. They were all confiscated. And now the church elections came and Bonifer put all his efforts into the election of key church positions, campaigning for the selection of independent non-Nazi officials. But despite Bonifer's efforts in the election fraud, an overwhelmingly majority of the key church positions went to Nazi-supported people. But the confessing church, which he was a founding member of, remained faithful. And it was a major source of Christian opposition to the Nazi government. The Barnum Declaration, Karl Barth, and adopted by the Confessing Church, insisted that Christ, not the Fuhrer, was the head of the church. However, the other Protestant churches of the time in the newly established Nazi submissive German Evangelical Church and their obedience to the state authority, to the Nazi party. These state churches acquiesce to the Nazi party. In 1933, a representative of the Vatican came and he later was to become Pope Pius XII. He met with the Nazi regime and he signed what was called the Concordat. It gave the church their autonomy, but it was only as long as they did not interfere or organize against the Nazi party, so they were to stand down. The Vatican fears of this time were the loss of liberty that would be brought to them if they did not enter the table of compromise. So they gave Adolf Hitler his first major diplomatic victory. Nazi power was now on the rise. Also, the majority of the 20,000 Protestant pastors refused to get involved. They stood down as evil was overcoming good, as tyranny was overcoming liberty. They stood by and watched 
and the lion's share of them did nothing. But Hitler, he promised change, and change did come. In 1938, the Gestapo banned Bonifer from Berlin, and in March of 1940, the Gestapo came again. They shut down the seminary he was in. And shortly, the outbreak of World War II. Bonifer hoped that the Ecumenical Council would restore peace, but there was no way to peace when Hitler finally grasped the power he had. 1938, Hitler publicly spoke to the nation. And here's what he said. I want again today to be a prophet. If the international Jewish finance people inside and outside of Europe, if they succeed in getting the nations of the world into a world war, the result will not be the Bolshevism of the world. And so the victory of the Jewish people. No, the result will be the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. Do you know that the public response to that speech was overwhelmingly applause? Bonifer left for the United States at the invitation of the Union Theological Seminary in New York. He wrote that I had come to the conclusion I made a mistake in coming back to America. I must live through this difficult period in our nation's history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after World War if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. He said this, he said, Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice from security. So he returned to Germany on the last scheduled steamer to cross the Atlantic before the war. Back in Germany, Bonifer was persecuted. The Nazi authorities forbidden him to speak in public and he was required to report his activities to the Gestapo police on a regular basis. Persecution grew and grew, and in 1941, he was forbidden to print or publish his sermons. In the meantime, Bonifer would not stand down. He was salt and light. He joined a group to remove Hitler. In the face of Nazi atrocities, the full scale of which Bonifer learned, he concluded that the ultimate question was for a responsible man to ask is not how he, he is to extricate himself from the affair, but how the coming generation shall continue to live. He said that the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. He knew that the blood of the martyrs might once again be demanded. Here's what he said. But this blood, if we really have the courage and the loyalty to shed it, will not be innocent. Shining like that of the first witness for the Christian faith. On our blood lies heavy guilt, the guilt of the unprofitable servant who is cast into outer darkness. Bonifer said that the war and the persecution of the Jews, or in other words, injustice, it grabbed his conscience and attached his heart to this resistance against the Nazi party. Bonifer said God was a God of justice and peace, and as a Christian, he could not stand down while innocent people were being tortured and killed. Being a pacifist was not the answer, but it was a cowardly excuse to not become involved. For the Christian, for Bonifer, it was now to be salt and light. 
He wrote this. He knew what was coming. He said, I do not regret this path in any way. See, he was the moral backbone of the Nazi resistance. He gave moral guidance to the German people to deny their military oath to serve Hitler and the Nazi party. He was an inspiration to them. He met with other church contacts and he told them about the conspiracy to kill Hitler. He said, you're living now and need to do something now to stop what seemed unstoppable. Well, the Nazi army, they were marching along. They defeated France. And in the May of 1941, the surrender of France came. Hitler returned home to Berlin to one of the largest celebrations in German history. Germans celebrated the surrender and invasion of France. Now was a time where Bonifer decided to get married. He knew his time was short and he decided to marry the young woman he loved, Maria von Beta Myra. During this short time with his wife, he enjoyed this time, but he was continuously frustrated because now, by the summer of 1939, hundreds of clergy would not get involved, but now, ironically, were now in prison. He also helped many Jews escape from Germany, from the Nazi party. And it was during this time with his wife that Bonifer worked on his writings called ethics that people must examine what the will of God is as an act of faith he wrote these letters to keep up the spirits of his former students as things grew worse and worse under the Nazi party at Christmas time 1942 Bonhoeffer wrote an essay a Christmas letter on the 10 years under Hitler and what the future hope was and what kind of world they would pass on to the future generations in Germany. As I said, he knew that the ultimate test of the moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to his children. Bonhoeffer was actively involved in, as I said, various plots to kill Hitler. He was a brave man his phone was tapped, and unfortunately, on the 5th of April, 1943, he was arrested. For a year and a half, he was imprisoned in a military prison, awaiting his trial. His blanket was so dirty, he would not use it. But then, he made friends with fellow prisoners and some guards. He continued his Christian work. And actually, some sympathetic guards helped him smuggle his coded letters out of the prison that were later published. Bonifer was condemned to death on April the 8th, 1945. The vicious, ugly Nazi interrogations. Evil. A kangaroo court without witnesses. At dawn on April the 9th, 1945, the next day, he was sent and executed at the concentration camp by hanging. Just two weeks before, our soldiers from the United States 90th and 97th Infantry Divisions liberated, brought liberty to that concentration camp. And it was just one month before the demise of the Nazi Party in Nazi Germany. Bonhoeffer, he loved to read the Bible and he loved the book of Psalms. He was calm. He knew shortly he would be forever with Christ the Lord, his Savior. And during those terrible interrogations in that concentration camp, he offered no defense for himself. He said this, this is the end for me. The beginning of life. 
Bonhoeffer was stripped of his clothing, and he was led naked to the execution yard, and he was hanged there. The prison doctor who witnessed the execution wrote, he said, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and then climbed a few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In almost 50 years that I have worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. Bonifer, the great man, the theologian, the pastor, the one who stood up against the Nazi party. He came to fully realize at the end of his life that the challenges of life, the challenges of his life, the difficulties, the duties, the problems, even the successes and the failures. He said that in doing these things, we put ourselves in the arms of God. 